we are counting down the days until the release of our new book, Scaling Smart, How to Design a Self-Managing Business. My husband, Rich Fetke, and I co-authored the book to share what we've learned about business strategy as the co-founders of Real Wealth. In this episode, we'll talk about some of those strategies with a woman we mention in the book, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and venture capitalist, Lisa Song Sutton. Before she launched and scaled several companies in various industries, including real estate, she was a former litigation attorney in Las Vegas and former Miss Nevada. She's currently a general partner for a $20 million venture capital fund called the Veteran Fund, which invests in veteran-led companies. You'll hear about some of the key concepts we focus on in our book and the real-life experiences that have helped all three of us get clear on our life and business goals. Among the key concepts in this interview, how you choose the right business for profit, impact, and purpose, how you find a partner that shares your vision, how you can deal with shifting priorities, how to make it happen as a husband and wife team, and much more. We did this interview live during the 2024 Limitless Financial Freedom Expo in Dallas, where we were also celebrating the release of our new book, which comes out September 10th. Bigger Pockets asked us to write the book based on Rich's 20 years of experience as a business coach and our combined 40 years of experience creating and scaling our own company. We'll also be holding a book launch party on September 8th at Movement Climbing Gym in Denver, Colorado. You can get the details for that at realwealthshow.com. Just click on the Connect tab. But if you can't join us in Denver, we have a virtual book launch on September 21st. It's free to participate at both of these events. Just register ahead at realwealthshow.com, again, under the Connect tab. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Well, welcome to The Real Well Show, our live edition at the Limitless Expo. I'm here with my very wonderful, handsome husband, Rich Fetke. <laughs> Good to be here. Good to look at you <laughs> and this audience. Yeah, it's great to be here. We're going to open up to questions. If anybody has a question, come on up. There's a microphone here and uh, we can have a discussion or answer any question. Until Oh, we got someone coming on up. Keeping it real. Mm-hmm. Keeping the real and real well. Hello. What's your name? Hello. My <laughs> name's Craig Fisher from Ohio in the summer, Florida in the winter. Um, nice. We're single family investors and we're starting to step it up and buy more because the properties are cash flowing, even though the cash flow is tighter. So, my question to you you like under the radar type communities, and that's kind of what we are in Ohio. I feel like what I've seen and felt around here so far is that we're going to get a lot more aggressive because the financing is available, long-term, fixed, 20-year, we can get decent rates, they cash flow, and uh, I feel like we should just quit analyzing so much and just go out there and buy the no-brainer houses that we want to own for life. But I just want to see what your guys' thoughts were on that. So your your specific question is? Is... Do you think it's a good time in a small community if you can cash flow? Job basis is good. We don't build, but we'll renovate. You know, we try just to do nice single family houses, middle income. But I'm pretty convinced that we're just going to really step it up and just quit overanalyzing stuff. Right. I mean, it really comes down. We wrote a lot about this in Scaling Smart, our new book there. It's coming out September 10th with Bigger Pockets. Um, is first step is the first chapter is about um, being very clear about why. Why am I doing it? And real estate has a really funny way of becoming extremely addictive. And so is money. Uh, We've often, Rich, do you want to talk a little bit about your chapter on bigorexia and what I mean by addiction? Sure. Yeah. I think your why matters a lot uh, for any question, like anything you're, what you're looking for growth, but um, yeah, the bigorexia part in the book is uh, I used to be a competitive bodybuilder, and you would think that bodybuilders are vain and uh, think they're the best things in the world, but bigorexia means that they are just the opposite. They have these little soft, weak hearts, 
and they think they're not big enough. So they're always trying to get bigger. So that's why you see these guys who are 275 pounds and they start doing growth hormone and all this stuff because it's never enough. They, they never feel big enough. And Kathy and I've seen that um, with ourselves and but also more with colleagues, other people, investors. It's never enough. So that's where you really come by, come back to what's important to me. Why am I trying to grow? And when we ask people this, like, what, what's your why? It's I want financial freedom. I want more time with my family, more time with my friends, more time to do what I want. And they create just the opposite. So you should tell them shit about uh, the uh, about Vicky. Well, yeah, I I'd kind of mentioned this earlier that I have a friend who's a big fund manager and she has outperformed everything she probably ever dreamed. Uh, she recently sold a fund for millions of dollars. And I was sitting with her and her family. We were skiing and it was lunchtime. And, um, and she said, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm going to do another fund. And her husband and her son were like, no, no, mom. Like, no, we, we don't want you to do that. And she's like, well, I want to, I want to get to a hundred million. And, and we're like, and I just said, why? Mm. And it was just something she felt like she needed to do, which might be an ego play when her family, what's most important to her just wanted her, you know? So coming back to you and your question, are you clear about the why of where you want to end up and what are you doing it for? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I appreciate that very much. I look forward to your book. We're kind of playing a lot right now in life and some of my older mentors are like, you can only travel so much, you can only play so much. And at some point you got to do something you enjoy. So part of it's that, you know, it's like, we don't see ourselves ever not playing real estate. So, but I need to dive into that question more. I appreciate that very much. You know, it's like where heart and soul is this coming from? What's the real why? So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. And specifically, I think just coming back to your question specifically, uh, we're always a big fan of stick to your lane. So what you know and what you've been doing and what's been working for you investing wise is like, it's, it's so easy to, you know, jump down this path of like, Oh, multifamily is going to work out for me. It's helpful. Yeah. The shiny object syndrome. So I'm, I would just say like, you know, your market, you know what you're doing, you know, stick with it. Focus on that. Also, there's a, there's a great book. Um, you can find it on Amazon. It's like little skinny green book. It's called values based financial planning. Um, and I had a financial planner recommend this book to me like years ago. And, um, it has an exercise in there, um, where, you get out a piece of paper and you write down um, the word money on the bottom piece of the paper. And you ask yourself, why is money important to me? So I was like, oh, I, you know, flexibility, right? So then you write flexibility. And then you ask yourself, why is flexibility important to me? And you do it like 15 times. So then you end up with a list of like values, right? Family, whatever's on the list, you end up with this list. And it's actually really helpful. Thank you so yeah. much. It's like a mini Tony Robbins conference. <laughs> That's what he's always saying. What's the why? So thank you guys. It, for that. it all starts there and it's chapter one of our book. So that if you... Sometimes people only get through the first chapter and that's okay because that's going to be the <laughs> most important one yeah. in this. Yeah. The how and you know the what, the where. There's lots of answers to that. Everyone in this that's entire great. conference is investing a little differently in a little different place. There's lots of ways to do it. But the most important thing is being super clear. Okay, before we take the next question, I just want to introduce <laughs> Song Sutton, who is who is a former Miss Nevada. Mm -hmm. And she we wrote a chapter about Lisa in the book, Scaling Smart, because she scaled smart a lot. And, uh, and so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you've scaled inside and outside of real estate. Yeah. So I, I started my business career in law, um, working business litigation and business bankruptcy. And then I started my first company and turned entrepreneur in 2012, um, selling alcohol and cupcakes in Las Vegas. <laughs> <Smart>. <laughs> started the company and didn't know how to bake when we started the company. Uh, but my co-founder with that um, was a girlfriend of mine from the modeling industry. And she had this great idea to sell alcohol cupcakes. And I was just like, I love the idea. Like it's going to work in Vegas move to Vegas and I'll help you start the company. And I kept my day job at the firm um, because as you guys know, any new endeavor takes money. So I kept my day job at the firm and I, every free penny I had, I was funneling it into the bakery. And um, it was an incredible business. We had it for 11 years. Um, we sold it to a national bakery brand. Wow. Um, but that one experience of starting a business 
I realized, wow, I can have my own business as long as I team up with an operations partner and we put in processes and we put in systems and we put in great teams, I, I can get into any industry. And, yeah. and so that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And you, and, and one of the things I love about what you wrote in the book, it's kind of our chapter two, which is once, once you've figured out what you want and what you want this business to do for you and you're disciplined in that. And what I mean is so easy to forget why we did it. We did it to get in because we wanted more free time or to do the things we love or to get into better sh- shape or to spend more time with our family. And then we do none of that. <laughs> and then the business takes over and runs everything. And we're saying, flip that. You got to know what you really want. Rich looks at his goals and personal goals. I want to take care of my health, my wife, my family. You know, the, these are the things he looks at to, and checks off every day to make sure he did it. What do you definitely rookie podcast needs. <laughs> All right. So, um, so yeah, the second chapter, then knowing what your business is, is doing. So let, and you, you did, a, you gave a great example of that in the book. You worked for a brokerage where as Miss um, Nevada, she had a lot of clients and very high net worth clients. And in, at the brokerage she was working at, someone tried to steal them from her. And yeah. so what did you do about that? Well, I was like, um, I, you know, I, I think as you operate out of this place of like everyone, you think everyone's going to be your friend and that everyone likes you. (laughs) Um, and so it's always this like jarring reality when that's not the case and you don't feel like you did anything to earn the negative attention. Um, so yeah, I had this, this terrible circumstance, uh, where, um, you know, when you work with people in a company, you assume that your colleagues and, and perhaps friends, but colleagues at, at the very base, Um, and it turned out not to be the case where it was just super, super competitive and uh, competition's fine, but it was like unethical, um, of like stealing clients and things like that. And so, um, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go get my own brokerage then. Um, and at the time I was with a a global brand, um, with Sotheby's, I was there for five and a half years. We had a great team there. Um, and I went and got Christie's, which is an international global brand. Um, and I brought Christie's international real estate to Las Vegas. And, and got to design a company where people support each other and don't tear each other down. Yes, exactly. And then yeah. The fascinating right. thing I think that happens, and I know your story, is that you go from thinking about what do I want from my business, right? And then you think about what's my business about? What can I create here? How can I serve people? And then you'll often go to the next thing is like, how can I make a bigger difference in the world? So I would love to hear a little bit more about your the fund. Yes. So... um you know, it's actually, it's because of Ken, I did this exercise with him where he rolled out butcher paper and he was like, gave me a pen and he was like, write down all your stuff, lady. You know, he's like, write down all your things, Sounds you like know, Ken. <laughs> yeah, write down your stuff. And that's Ken McElroy. For- Ken McElroy. Yeah. So all the businesses, you know, it's real estate brokerage at the time I still had the bakery, um, shipping stores, um, investments, real estate investments. So I write down all the businesses. I write down all the nonprofit work from my time as Miss Nevada. I was I did like 500 community appearances. So was still on the boards of several nonprofits. Um, I wrote all of that down. I wrote down all the projects I'm involved in. And he was like, circle the ones that make you money. So I'm like, okay. So I'm circling. There's a whole right side of the page. There's no circles. And then he's like, circle the ones that you could see yourself doing for the next 10 years. And I was like, okay. So I'm making some circles. And then he's like, Circle the ones that you could, um, that the work you do makes you feel like impactful, purposeful. That the work you're doing for whatever that is, whether it's a nonprofit or not, that the work you're doing is impactful and purposeful. And I did, I did that. I circled the ones I felt that way about. And that one exercise was what got me thinking about selling the bakery because it only had one circle around it and it was that it would make me money. I couldn't see myself doing it for another 10 years. I didn't feel like I hadn't baked in probably seven years at that point, right? I was so far removed from operations. Like I'd show up at like our A-list event stuff and like that was it. I was so far removed. So I was just like, I'm like wasting my time, right? So um, then I was like, I want to get into venture capital, but like in a meaningful way. And um, I started doing due diligence on funds that I could LP into. Um, It's a limited partner to be an investor in. And um, 
I went down the rabbit hole. I did due diligence on one that was in Park City. I flew out there, met with their GPs. It's like this really impressive list of, you know, Goldman Sachs guys and whatever. And I was just like, oh, like maybe this is what venture is. And I asked them, I said, what else are we doing for these founders besides writing checks? And they, no one had a good answer. And I was just like, is this venture not even a week later? This is like putting it out in the universe, right? Not even a week later, Justin Nahama um, from the Veteran Fund called me. And this is a, a friend of mine I knew from law. And he was like, hey, I just partnered up with two of my really good buddies. I'm excited for you to meet them. We just created this VC fund called the Veteran Fund. And we're investing in early stage technology focused on national security and dual use. And they have to have a veteran or military spouse on leadership team. And that like totally resonated with me. I come from a military family. Um, so I was like, I love take my money, right? I'm in, I'll LP in. And two days later, I called Justin back. I was like, what is it going to take for me to, to be a GP? And he was like, it's not really how it works. He's like, we're not turning all of our LPs into GPs. Oh, wow. And I was like, look, like I want to get into venture. I want to get in a meaningful way. I genuinely feel like the work you guys are doing is so impactful and purposeful. And it's like really resonating with me. Um, and like, I expect us to be on like a multi-decade journey together. So I'll take less in fund one. And then we can talk about fun too, you know, and, and he was just like, oh my God, you're not gonna let this go. Um, and so that's how I ended up becoming a GP for the fund was because of just me pushing, right. And asking and really wanting to, to drill in on a fund that I felt like was making purposeful, impactful investments. How does that fund create purposeful, meaningful? Yeah. So, um, so that investment thesis, right? So investing in early stage technology focused on national security and dual use, um, they must have a veteran or military spouse on the leadership team. So, I mean, I, you know, not going to get political, but I, I think national security is extremely important, like for our country, right. And like investing in American entrepreneurship and American businesses and American innovation. Um, and then on top of that, just looking at the, as at a veteran of their profile in relation to their ability to operate, right? If you're looking for someone to put your money behind on a business, I want to know that they're a good operator. So I'm almost less concerned with their business experience than I am with their mental grit, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And so these folks who come out, especially these are high level folks, right? These are former Navy SEALs, former Green Braves, former Army Rangers. Like they are literally battle tested yeah. and they have the mental grit and the wherewithal to just keep going, right? And not <laughs> take no for an answer. And it's like you said, they know what's missing when they're in combat that they want. They yes. Want yeah. Companies. So that's what's really cool. So our portfolio companies now, you know, it's 3D printed drones, 3D printed satellites, cybersecurity. The technology that these veteran founders have created was is literally the technology that they were like prototyping when they were in Afghanistan and Iraq, when they were boots on the ground. And they were just like, the stuff we have is either not working or it's not iterating fast enough. And they're like clipping it together themselves and then, and launching it out of there. Like they're just like, let's just try it now. Wow. So it's pretty amazing what they're building. And so kind of coming back to scaling smart, this was chapter two, just really what is your business purpose and how do you get your whole team aligned with that purpose? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great yeah. purpose. So and the subtitle of the book is how to design a self-managing business. And you've obviously done that, you know, from going from making cupcakes to not having to be involved for seven years and all that on your brokerage, your real estate brokerage, yep. that's now a self-managing business. Right. I'm no longer a buy-sell agent. I just help train and mentor our agents. So, so it's super fun, I think. I would love to hear some tips from you on what do you think are some of the most important ways to create a self-managing business where yeah. you don't have to be involved. It frees you up to do what you love to do and what you're best at. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of partnerships and partnering with an operating partner. Um, I think you have people out there who are like, oh, I've had terrible partnership experiences in the past. I don't want to partner with anybody. Um, I just I just think it's, it's nicer to partner with the operations partner who one, has skin in the game. And then two, you guys are both dedicated to like same company goals, right? Like you want the company to grow, you want it to succeed, you want to take care of your customers. Like those are baseline values that you already share because you're, you have an ownership mentality versus this is a hired gun or an employee that might be looking for a better opportunity six months from now. Right. So I like partnering with operations, operational partners. Um, you don't have to give them 50, 50 right off the bat. That was a mis actually a mistake I made in the beginning. <laughs> Common mistake. I just, I didn't know. Right. I was like, we're starting it together. We'll just be 50, 50. Um, now I have learned my lesson a little bit. Um, 
you know, with the mailbox stores, for example, I love the business model. And I was like, I'm going to do these. I have zero time to go operate them myself. Right. Um, so I teamed up with an operations partner. Um, and it's a girlfriend of mine, Sarah. So all my partners have been either friends that I knew or colleagues like Justin that like I knew and like got to know better. Um, I'm a big fan of, of partnering with either family or friends because you know them, like, you know, them really well, you know what they're like when they're mad, you've seen them mad, you've seen them stressed out, you've seen them have a breakup, you've seen them like have these life things happen to them and you already know how they handle it. So you probably are also like very clear on who you don't want to partner with your, in your family. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you have like the dramatic girlfriends or the ones that like they, they can't handle if they got like a speeding ticket one day, you know what I mean? To ruin their entire day. And you're just like, Probably not going to be a great business partner for me. <laughs> Still love you, but yeah. So do you, are there any questions from the crowd? If so, there's a microphone here. Feel free to come up. We can take questions. Hey, oh, we've got, we got a question here. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. Hi, Andy. I'm Andy McAllister. Oh, lovely. Such a big fan, guys. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Yes. So I, I, you're both such strong women in what it is that you do. And, and in male-dominated worlds, I'm curious how you maintain your yourself and your, your truth to yourself and your femininity and really be such a badass in what it is that you do. Talk to me about that. I'll answer that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I will say when, I, when we first started, I don't know... T- when we first met probably 30 years ago and I was starting a business and I was trying to be in a man's world and I wore a black suit mm-hmm. and I was trying to be really manly mm-hmm. and Rich just was like, what was that? You know, we got home and he's like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, I, what, what did I do? You know? And he's like, just be you just wear a dress, you know, like you don't have to be a man. And, and I, it was just such a like wake up call. I didn't know. I didn't know how to, be a woman in his man's world, but that was 20 years ago. That, that was a lot. It was a while ago, but yeah. uh, I started to just like own my femininity. And I remember being in a boardroom with all these businessmen in black suits and they were just talking about stuff I didn't understand. And I just stopped and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. can you explain what you just said? And all of a sudden the whole room went, and I could, like, everyone could breathe because no one knew what they, what this man was saying. How funny. But I had the courage to ask for directions, right? So <laughs> they, so that's when I learned, oh, this, this feminine energy is needed because I, all of a sudden, everything changed where the other men felt like they could also ask questions. So that's just an example. I don't know. What about you? Very similar vein. <laughs> and just the, you know, just the authenticity, right? It gets you so much further. Um, I remember the early days of the cupcakes. It was the first year um, we were trying to get them into the MGM. And so we had a meeting with the president at the time of MGM. So it's like big deal, right? Like we're there early, we're in the big boardroom, the whole thing. And he walked in and he was like, you girls are cute. Are the owners coming? And we were just like, <laughs> so deflated. Like we were just like, wow. you know, and Danielle didn't even know what to do. She was just like terrified. And I was like, it's us, you know, like, I was just like, what else are we supposed to say? You know? So. I think, uh, you know, oftentimes like there's going to be this like kind of underestimation that happens um, or we're very good at counting ourselves out, right? Like we tell ourselves we're not ready or we don't have enough data or we don't have enough experience or whatever it is. And like, you know, we've seen it on the investor side where I'll have, I'll have a man pitch me on, on a business and it's just an idea and he's going to ask for $500,000 and tell you what a great idea he has. And I'll meet a woman who has demonstrable traction. She's got a hundred users already and the app is on its second iteration and she's scared to ask for the money because she doesn't feel like she's ready. And I'm like, you guys, like we need to get some of this energy over here where it's just an idea and you're asking for $500,000, you know? Like there's a level of confidence there that I think sometimes as women, we just devalue ourselves like off the bat and we, we cut ourselves out of the conversation and we don't have to do that. Yeah, that's great. Really good. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, too. Come on up. Powerful. You'll be next. <laughs> hey guys. Is it? Hey. Yeah. There okay. we go. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and 
doing this for us and giving us education. We all appreciate it. Thank I'd you. like to know, how do you keep track on your evolving goals, like your five, 10 year goals? If they keep on evolving, keep on changing, how do you stay? Okay. You know, you could be three years into your five year goal and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I want to change and totally drastic change. How do you guys deal with that? I'm going to hand that to Rich. He's our goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's life, right? Things are constantly changing. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that 10 year vision of where do you want to go? Really seeing it, visualizing it, meeting your future self, seeing where you want to be, and then having that be kind of your guiding star that you're moving toward. And then breaking that down into, I think a three year is really valuable. There's three years like, tangible, you can see it, you can feel it, you can believe it. But as you're moving toward that that three-year vision, yeah, there's constantly going to be shifts and everything. Uh, so I think one of the key things there is looking at the, if, am I giving up that for something else? Am I letting my fear hold me back because that's what I really wanted or kind of like pivoting in the moment? So it happens a lot at our company, Real Wealth, uh, where we're like, this is where we're going. This is our three-year vision, or this is our one-year goal, we come back from, so if this is our three year, what happens this year? And then in that one year, sometimes we'll set that in an annual planning session. We'll spend two days together with our leadership team and we'll come up with specifically what are the big, you know, maybe four to six goals for the year. And then as we're moving through the year, sometimes it shifts, sometimes something, a new idea, an opportunity comes up. And so we run it through what we've created. We call it a business opportunity analyzer. We call it, so it's the BOA. It stands, you know, the, the acronym. Uh, so it's a, if it can survive the BOA, get squeezed through the business opportunity analyzer, then let's do it. But it's like 13 different questions that that's in the book, but it's um, 13 questions that looks at, have we done this before? If we, if we have, how did it work out? Did it work well or not? And if it didn't work out, why didn't it work out well? And then one of the biggest ones, like what you're talking about, is you know you can't you can only go after so many things at once. So if you have these big goals, and I love to use the rule of three because we can the, the brain gets overwhelmed if you have more than three major goals as a company, as an individual. So it's like looking at that and saying, okay, this is here's this new goal that just came up, this new maybe pivot. And we look at that and we say, okay, so of our big goals here that we've set, which one are we going to say no to? to say yes to this one. And that can really test and stress test it because if it's like, everyone's like, no, we can't let go of these goals. But it's like, we don't have the resources, we don't have the time or the energy to add another goal on here. Then you have to really look at say, of these that we set, if we're gonna put one aside to replace it with this, is that important enough? And just that alone, yeah, you I wanna speak to that? I just can't emphasize enough the power of this BOA. Because usually somebody who starts a company is not the person who takes the company um, to, 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 right. to, to scale it, to, yeah. to scale yeah. it uh, and, and keep it going. So the visionary, the, the entrepreneur is full of ideas and they've got, they've got this superpower to get this idea off the ground, but then they get bored and then they want a new thing. And their team has just figured out the systems for the old idea. And then now the, they've got to do a new idea and they're, and they, and then the next day there's a new idea. And then the next day there's a new idea. Anybody relate to this? <laughs> and so the operational team is in this whipsaw or just totally overburdened. And you're not going to keep your people <laughs> when you burn them out. Sure. So I, as a visionary, um, had to humble myself and, um, and submit to my team. And I can't emphasize enough how difficult that is and how important that is. Because at first I was mad. Why don't they like my new ideas? My not, my ideas are great. And and then it, then Rich taught them to ask me, you know, well, what do you need me to let go of? Because I can't do yesterday's idea. With and then we okay. came up with the boa, which is to really what there needs to almost be a business plan. That's what it is for this new idea. And is it going to generate enough money such that we either hire a new team for it? or we take our current team off what they're already doing. And what most companies find out, like you look at a Ken McElroy, he's not doing a whole lot. I mean, he is, but his core business has been kind of the same sure. for a long time. It just, it, they've gone deep and they've become experts at that. In multifamily. And, and for us, it's single family. We, we veered off from that. And when we did it, it 
whipsawed the whole company, yeah. right? So we're back to what we do best. Mm -hmm. You have managed to do a lot of different things. So, and because of partnerships though, yeah. right? Um, but very similar to what um, Rich was saying is, um, so we do OKRs in each of the companies. It's objectives, key results. We pick four main strategy goals that we're gonna be executing per quarter. And then you list the key results under each of those objectives. What's it going to take, right? So if you want, I don't know, if you want, uh, you know, we, we want $2 million worth of new revenue growth, right? What does that break down to in a quarter? How many new clients is that? How many new purchases is that? Whatever that is, right? So you break that down. Everyone on the team has to claim one box or more under the objective. And that is their like task to do. Um, but to your point, right? Like, there's only four main objectives that we are focused on per quarter per business. Everything else we have to say no to. And same thing with the fund. We looked at 1,400 deals last year and we invested in 14 of them. Wow. There's a lot of no's, right? And a lot of great companies, a lot of great founders. And, and, and there were so many that were so good that were like just outside of the thesis, right? Maybe they didn't have a veteran on the leadership team yet or whatever it was, right? Like it was like so close to the thesis, but it wasn't on it. And we we're like, you have to stay tight on the investment thesis. That's the old uh, Zig Ziglar. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. Yeah. <laughs> so visionaries do need to be very self-aware and be willing to hear what their operations team needs from them. And, uh, and so that's been, that's been our journey. Right. And so now when I've got a great new idea, it's literally like, okay, who do we need to hire for that? Yeah. You know, because yeah. the current yeah. team's busy. Yeah. yeah. I know you, you had a question, All right? <laughs> Hi. So, Hi. Thank you so much for all the wonderful advice and nuggets. Um, so I'm in partner with my husband of uh, 22 years. We run some businesses together nice. and just the jumble of our marriage and also running a business and the ways those, you know, what advice do you have? Uh, we've run into several husband wife teams here who are also in business and just, you know, do you have any good tips? Uh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh. Um, it's uh, a whole other book. It's it's a whole other. It will be another book. Yeah, we actually spoke at uh, Bigger Park at BPCon last year on investing with your spouse. Yeah, building a business with your spouse because it, it's it can be it can be very challenging. You know, it's yeah. like we we're, we're twenty seven years together, uh, married thirty years together, um, and twenty one years in business together, and uh, it's all been easy. <laughs> 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 now we definitely had our challenges. Um, I would say. Getting clear on what is your unique strength and what you bring to the partnership, you know, treating it like if it's a if it's a business project or anything, it's like what what's your greatest strength that you bring to the to the table and what does your husband bring to it? And then stay in your lane. Don't try to come over and do you know do what he does and he doesn't try to do what you do or tell you how to do what you do. I think that's a huge one. That was a big one. I, I think a yeah. It, in addition to that, uh, for me at least. Um, having him be able to see the value of my uniqueness uh, because I'm not like him. I'm not structured. I don't have lists of things. I don't have checklists. I, I am a more of a creative thinker and, um, and I would sometimes feel bad about myself for not having his strengths. And it wasn't until, you know, he, I, I think when we did, we read rocket fuel or something, it's like, Oh, okay. I'm just, no, I'm just normal for this type of person for a visionary. Yeah. And, and to be respected for that. And then for him to never shut that down, but also not agree to all of it. So how do you, you know, what, that's a balancing act. So what he learned is to not shut me down, is to listen to me and ask questions until I would find a way for me to go, yeah, this was a really bad idea, <laughs> you know, because he'd ask enough questions, but just out of really curiosity, oh, like, oh, when, what do you, how, tell me more. How do you see this? What, just asking questions like he was really interested. But I would finally, it would get me to a point of talking myself out of it, which may or may not have been your intention, but I felt heard. And that's really, at the end of the day, what I needed. It's really, yeah, that's yeah. huge. So one thing Kathy just mentioned is the book Rocket Fuel. If you've read that one, yeah, great. Gino Wickman. Um, yeah, but for me, 
it, it, that came really difficult, like being curious. I don't know what, what it was growing, growing up in Boston and being a, you know, this thing, just telling, um, uh, mansplaining and all that. So I literally it was, it was so hard for me. I was going to get a tattoo on my wrist of a question mark. And so that's my, you know, my advice to, to you as a man, it's now my mantra is be curious when I'm ready to say something. It's like, well, oh, be curious. Do I fully understand her? And I'll keep asking questions until, until I say, I don't ask questions and I'll say, so let me make sure I fully understand you. This is what you're saying. And then sometimes she'll say yes. And, you know, and then once, when she finally says, yes, you truly, you truly fully understand me, then we can move forward. If, if a woman feels totally understood, the man will get what he wants. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> something else here. <laughs> I, I, I have a question for you guys. So you're, you've been together 30 years in business, 21 years. What was the impetus or the catalyst to actually partner together? And like, what, like, what did that look like? Like, how, what did it take to do it? I, it took uh, uh, me knowing what a really bad partner was. And um, I think I told it to the group earlier, but I early on in business, the business grew so quickly. I didn't know how I don't have any operational skills really. So I thought maybe the best way for me to do this was bring in a partner. I let a partner come in 50, 50, didn't buy in. He didn't take 50% of the work. Uh, so I found myself giving half my check away, but doing twice as much work. So, um, I was able to buy him out. Remember he never bought in mm -hmm. lessons learned. And I just looked at my husband who was a business coach and, and I was like, can we do this? Can, can you're coaching all these executives and they're everything in their lives is getting better. Can you coach me? And can we survive this? Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was a, a question. It was 2008. So a hard time yeah. to get started in a real estate, you know, mm -hmm. business together. Yeah. But, um, you know, we've, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked. That's awesome. Uh, um, yeah. I don't know anything to add to that. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And you're just about to find out. I know. So we're not partnered anything yet, you know, but he's, I'm so glad he's he just my, got engaged. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my fiance, is a, he's a fighter pilot. So F-15s, F-22s, um, he'll be getting out of active duty Air Force, um, doing commercial, um, doing corporate pilot work. But um, obviously I'm like, you should start a business. You should go to real estate. You know, I'd like all these, I'm like, there's a million things you could be doing, you know? Um, so I think I want to, I want to leave room for him to like find what he's genuinely interested in. Um, but I've never, I've never partnered with a significant other. I've partnered with friends, but I've never partnered with a significant other. Yeah. So and I'll just add on to that. If you are in a relationship or you are married, you are in a partnership. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so if there's your, your combined finances, mm -hmm. there is uh, sometimes raising kids together. So yeah. you are partners. So one of the most important things you can do as partners is have a shared compelling vision together. And so often there's Kathy and I do a couples workshop sometimes. And what we'll do is we'll have a couple sit down separately and write down their vision for where they want to be in 10 years. And they'll each write down all mm -hmm. the different things they want for travel, for kids, for business, for investing. And then we say, okay, cool. Now share that with each other. And they put it together and they'll, and so often it's like, oh. I didn't know you wanted that. I didn't know you wanted to be there. And then from that, they combine that and literally create a whole written 10 year vision of where they're going to be together. And it's, it's I, really eye opening for couples. I really like that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. How do you find, I mean, it sounds so easy, but how do you just find a partner who does operations? That's yeah. like for all of us who have a million ideas, wouldn't that be great? Just have just find a bunch of people who do operations. Yeah. How do you do that. <laughs> I just I I do feel like I'm very blessed to have just like a pretty incredible network that's been built over time of just really wonderful people in my life. And they all have varied backgrounds and interests. And just taking the mailboxes, for example, Sarah, who's my partner with that, she and I were friends for years. She actually has a teaching degree and she was a seventh grade science teacher for a while, but then realized she made more money bartending on the Las Vegas Strip. So she was doing that. And she was complaining about, um, you know, just like the long, the long nights and weekends and dealing with, you know, crazy guys with uh, credit cards and, you know, it's just annoying. Right. So she was complaining about that when I was looking into the mailbox business and I was like, what am I looking for, for an, an operator for this? It's someone who's based in customer service. I don't care that they don't, so they have postal experience, right? That's not what I'm looking for. 
what's going to differentiate our store is the customer service. This is a retail job, right? So I was like, Sarah would be perfect for this. And so, um, kind of right time, right place, right time, right. Where she wanted to get out of what she was doing, um, and an opportunity to get into business ownership and entrepreneurship. Um, but I, I would say lean on your network, you know, what do you do? You put them through a personality test. I mean, it's a very specialized, this, when you, when you, uh, this has happened oftentimes with big groups will say, who is a operations person who's the visionary and there's more visionaries than operations. Mm. So do you, how do you yeah. know that they're good at detail? And yeah. See, I, yeah. I don't do a personality test. Um, but I think on the operations side, I think really anyone who's been hardcore customer service, so actually our real estate brokerage, um, some of our best agents, top performing agents, like these are people who make, you know, half a million dollar or more helping people buy and sell houses. I got them because they were doing bottle service in the day clubs in Vegas, like high end day clubs. Like you're not like a cocktail waitress at the Mirage. Like you're high end bottle service at Wet Republic. You are on your feet from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. in 110 degree heat, dealing with every drunk asshole with a black card, right? Like your EQ is so high and your level of resourcefulness is so high. Like you can help people buy and sell real estate. Let me teach this to you, you know? So it's the personality test. The personality test, yes. Nice. Awesome. Oh, that's good. Good wrap up. All right. We better wrap up. Okay. Well, Lisa, thank you, thank you, thank you for having, having me. me. Yeah, it's so good. And Rich, always great. Thank you all. And thank you, Tarl and Ken and Sarita and everyone who put on this fabulous event. Yes. Thank you. All right. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.